Good evening. I'm Andy Yoon. Um, all of us who are working on biomedical optics are familiar with this concept or this term, light penetration depth in tissue. This usually comes as a limitation or a problem to solve. In straight light or ballistic light we use in microscopy and OCT, they cannot propagate more than a few millimeters in tissue. And diffuse lights we use for sensing, imaging, and therapies, the maximum penetration is a few centimeters at most. So how do we solve this problem? There are some smart ideas around and using long wavelengths, near infrared wavelengths, or control the phase of the wavefront. And these are all very ex interesting ideas, but probably it's not going to be enough. And perhaps the most practical uh, approach is to use fiber optic catheter endoscope, bring the light from external light source into the body. But delivering the photons further into the tissue still remains a problem. So how do you solve this problem? So one thought I have was, what if we don't need to deliver light from outside? What if we can generate the light right there, inside, within the tissue? Um, and the question is how? And recently, my group has taken the first step along this direction um, and by working on biolaser. So I'm envisioning a laser that's entirely made out of biomaterials. And it's completely biocompatible with biological systems. And we know that laser consists of three major elements, and gain medium, cavity, and pump. And our first step is to um, use biomaterial for gain medium. So we turn into green fluorescence protein, GFP, and back then, I was the last human on Earth who learned about this fascinating molecule. And this is about 27 kilodalton protein, has a form of four, chlorophor, inside in the middle of the beta sheet, well isolated from outside. It's photostable, and you can encode, incorporate this GFP gene into any organisms to use that as a fluorescence reporter. And has a very bright and good optical characteristic as a fluorescence emitter. If you look at it, it has absorption and emission curves. And you can immediately maybe recognize that if you see, if you pump this molecule at short wavelengths, blue wavelengths, and then have a cavity resonator to have this light resonate at longer wavelengths, that it forms a quasi-full-level system, which is known to be very effective in generating laser. So it all sounds good. In old days, one of the pioneers of laser, he said that, well, if you, anything with laser, if you pump hard enough. So that's certainly encouraging. <laughs> but exactly how much hard do you need to pump? So if you go through a, some tedious calculation using some of the known parameters, you end up getting this number, two millijoule per square centimeter. So that's the number, if you, if you know the NC standard, for example, this is about two orders of magnitude lower than the thermal uh, damage threshold of a cell. So it's just fairly low. And on top of that, if you focus it down to small spot, you don't need a lot of energy. So, so far, looks encouraging. But eventually, I wanted to make use laser uh, this GFP as they are inside a cell. But cells is very small, so can you get enough gain? Would that be enough gain? So if you do some in bag of envelope calculation, how much proteins the cell may have, and actin protein is one of the most abundant one in the cell, and you attach, you put this GFP gene under the promoter of actin. They have a 10% your efficiency, transmission efficiency. Then you get approximately estimate about 10 micromolar to 100 micromolar for GFP concentration in a cell. That corresponds to about 10 million to 100 million GFP molecules in a cell. And using that pumping, you excite them. Then you estimate the gain. Then you approximately you know that the cavity, if you have a cavity, with the reflectivity 99.9%, .9 
then you have a good chance to make it lace. So Maltegeder, then was my postdoc in my group, and now is assistant professor in Germany, transfected a human cell with GFP and sandwiched with a pair of dichroic mirror he bought from Tholab, $100 each. And, and if you look at it, these are the, um, the setup, and small, and you pump with the nanosecond pulse. And normally the GFP are nicely spread over the cytoplasm, as you see in the fluorescence image. But once you excite them with the strong enough pump, then it turns into this interesting pattern. This is a laser emission pattern uh, coming from a single cell. They have an interesting output characteristic, well, different from fluorescence, above laser threshold, and has a fairly intense, it emits fairly intense output. There are 10 million or 100 million molecules in a cell. They are all excited and emit photons together in one nanosecond. So that corresponds to peak power about 10 milliwatt coming out of from a single cell. Fairly bright, and on top of that, it's a directional, the emission is not everywhere. It's, it's well-defined direction, which you can control, and by the cavity orientation. And if you look at the spectrum, it's again very different. Narrow band, sharp peaks, and even, you, can, you can even get a single frequency laser output. And line is, or huge spectral density, and line is about one million times. You can put this a laser lines, about a million laser lines inside your detection band this easily. So it has an interesting characteristic. Maybe we can harness these unique characteristics with something interesting. So I showed you about the emission pattern. I'm showing three different cells on the left. And the emission patterns are somewhat very complicated. But if you spray them in, into spectrum, they actually are made up a very well-defined a series of uh, modes, laser modes, with a well-defined pattern, transverse pattern, and uh, spe uh, the wavelengths. So one in the up there, your fundamental mode, the second order mode, and, and it's well defined. And these patterns are fairly stable if you don't touch anything. But if the, change, the cell changes their shape or the organelle distribution protein, their patterns and the changes. That's because the light emission, before they get emitted, they bounce back and forth inside the cavity more than 1,000 times. So any small changes inside a cell can result in a big changes in your signal outside. So this motion of electric field or emotion of cell, maybe you can use that to characterize cells or intracellular sensing or cytometry. All right, it sounds all exciting, but exactly how does it help in terms of optical penetration? So, so let me give you one example. Oh, well, if you... Before you get to that, one day, if you learn enough, you know how to control, how to generate this light at our will, maybe you can do something more amazing things. Getting back to the penetration depth, so let me give you one example about photodynamic therapy. This is a new treatment method, method uses, uh, using photoactivable drugs. So in cancer treatment case, in control, and tumor grows over time. When you deliver light, what well, therapy, uh, the PDT agent, and shine the laser, the tumor growth is significantly suppressed. But that's the case when the tumors is on the very superficial layer. For tumors that are deep, more than five millimeters, not much, from the surface, this PDT is no longer very effective. That's because you don't, those photons just don't get into the tumor. And my students, Iran Kim and Sungwon Kim, they develop a nanoparticles, it's a nano light bulbs, which you can deliver, that can be turned on by, chemically, by small molecules. And when they do that, they see an amazing, very, very highly efficient therapeutic effect. And this therapeutic effect is independent of where the tumor is. So that gives an idea, maybe we can do something interesting with this biolaser. Well, this is a photodynamic therapy without external photons now. So we are, I'm still thinking, 
and my groups are thinking hard, and I, I hope that you join me in thinking about this along this direction. And with that, thank you very much.